Happy Sunday, everyone. Welcome to Studio Sunday with Robin and Terry. Today is January 12th. Well, I hope you've been having a great week. It's so hard to get back uh, onto a regular schedule after the holidays for us. We are trying our best, but it is hard. So we're just going to plow through. Um, the first thing is Five Years Number 7 comes out in stores on Wednesday, so be sure to pick it up at your local comic book shop or on our website at abstractstudiocomics.com. Easy. And also this week we'll be adding the uh, Strangers in Paradise soft cover omnibus to the website store. Uh, it's two volumes of the entire story for $109.99. It's in a slip case. So um, you can go online and order that this week. Soft cover. Yeah. And it doesn't have the third book in it, right? It doesn't have a cover gallery. It's just the story. Okay. In a slipcase for $109.99. Okay. Any other questions? No. That's yeah. just everything I ever wanted to know. Okay. Okay, then let's get on with our questions. Okay. Okay, the first one is from somebody named Terry Jones. And he says, Good day, Robin and Terry. Hope you're well. I've just recently read through the Terry verse and have a question about a plot thread from SIP. Uh oh. This is kind of a long question, so hang in there. Okay. Issue one of the third volume begins with the time jump, with Francine being older, living with mom and daughter. Over the course of multiple time jumps throughout many issues, we learn Francine is still married to Brad. Oh, by the way, spoilers, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Wolf. <laughs> Sorry about that. In the fourth issue, when everybody dies. <laughs> Okay, she's still married to Brad. She hates her life and Mrs. Kachu. It's been 10 years since they last spoke so many. So Mary calls Kachu. Then Kachu surprises Francine. What happened to this plot thread? Did Terry decide to change it as he progressed towards the end of SIP? No, that all really happened. I don't know what the change would be. Francine was 10 years older. Yeah, well, oh man, this is so spoiler. Should we get into this on camera? Yeah, you might as well. Yeah. Uh, Just make it fast. Okay. Well, yeah. They have a big argument. Uh, oh, man. Spo okay, spoilers. If you've read the story, we'll talk about it. If you haven't read the story, stop. Okay, here we go. Uh, in issue 60, Francine marries Brad and Kachu begs her not to marry Brad and finally after 60 issues tells her I love you be with me we're the ones who are supposed to be together and because of things going on in Francine's life she holds firm because she's seen things in Kachu's life that scare her anyway okay so Francine marries Brad 10 years pass and then but Francine is missing Kachu like crazy and then Kachu shows up because Francine is depressed and Marie is worried about her and calls Kachu. And it's a big deal for Marie to contact Kachu and admit that, okay, Kachu, you're the one. Um, come save her. And so she does. And they get the back story, together and then they work from there. The story progresses on from there. Yeah. But you Let's had, you had a, an issue where there was an older Francine. Oh, no. There was, a, when Francine was pregnant and on her knees at the toilet throwing up every morning she started imagining all these other versions of her life what it would be like with or without Kachu and that's what that was and it lasted for like two or three issues so it didn't look like oh it's just two pages of fantasy it was you know figuring out these alternative choices depending on the choices she made and then she makes her choice and she goes into the kitchen and tells Brad her decision because she's seen her future with Brad or without Brad, or with Kachu or without Kachu, and she's made a choice. Well, she really didn't see her future. Well, she you know, imagined. she's imagining her future, right. So, yeah. you know, you get into their heads, yeah, yeah. you can see what's in their head. The 60s and 70s and are, were very convoluted. Oh, the <laughs> 1960s and 1970s <laughs> were very convoluted. Opinion. No, <laughs> that whole, uh, I'm, I'm throwing up and picturing my futures, uh, that was all in the 40s of Volume 3. You know, oh, okay. 40, 41, 42, 43. It's, it's a long series. It is a very long series. Lots happens. You have a lot of time to just let them wander off and daydream and picture things, you know. Um, I caught a lot of flack for that because people didn't want to see Francine without Kachu. 
Oh, that was a tough time. <laughs> we, we got through it, though. We did. We got through it. Okay, well, that was kind of a convoluted answer, but that's, that's all we have for you, story. <laughs> It's a complicated story. Plus, nobody wants to be stuck at the toilet throwing up for several Stop issues. Stop saying that. Oh, that's gross. Okay, let's move on. Thanks for asking. <laughs> in Rachel Rising, okay, our next question is, in okay. Rachel Rising, what made you use a child as one of the main characters? Uh, because I wanted a town where uh, things were different. Uh, like I was tired of the sexual predator always being the scariest looking guy living on the outskirts of town. I wanted it to be more like nature, where in nature, uh, the deadliest things are sometimes the most beautiful. So I picked this cute little girl who looks completely harmless. Everybody would let her pass. And she's the most dangerous thing in town. I thought, well, that's the best horror story element I've ever thought of. <laughs> um, and then the guy who would look like typecasting uh, killer in a teenage 80s movie, horror movie, is actually the sweetest guy in town, Earl. So uh, he's the one guy you can trust. So I just kind of turned things on their head. That's all. So you didn't have any problem having a little kid in a horror movie? No. I mean, or a horror comic? No, I didn't. Um, and I halfway justified it by her real age. You know, she's actually just been stuck in that form for 50 years, so. More spoilers, guys. More spoilers. You should not be listening to me talk <laughs> if you don't want to know this stuff. <laughs> Uh, yeah, she's not really 10. She just looks 10, you know, and again, like nature, you know, those cute little critters that if they bite you, you're, you're a goner. <laughs> uh, I just thought it was kind of sweet, you know, to, to have a kid like that. And, but what would it be like to, to actually be that person, be her stuck in that form and everything that she's seen, you know, so there's a lot to really investigate there as a writer. Um, like I think it adds a lot of depth to the story. Yeah, I, I'm tired of typecast, typecasting, you know, killers look like killers and kids are kids and, you know, all that. <sighs> Haven't we seen enough? So, um, I think in real life things are more complicated and I made them as complicated as I could. <laughs> okay. How's that? Good. Okay. okay. So, those are our two questions for today and you've been getting a lot of requests for some drawing lessons. Mm -hmm. So you're going to um, do one. Yeah, you know, I, in the last couple of answers, the past couple of videos, my answers have been more about theory and, you know, so I had some requests from young artists saying, show me, you know, really show me exactly what you're talking about because I would love to know. So I think let's try to draw something here and I will talk you through what I'm doing, thinking and looking at as I draw. Okay, sounds good. We're going to uh, pause this and rejoin you. Meet me here. Okay. Okay, so welcome back. I have here the most dangerous thing in the world, a blank page. We could draw a great sketch or write a new constitution on this thing. So the world is your oyster. So what I want to do today is draw a figure and show you what I look for as I draw. Um, I always start with the head and I kind of know already that I'm going to have a full body and my legs are going to be back like that, you know, something like that. Um, but it really measures off of the head. So if I draw the whole body first and then try to do the head, I have a real problem trying to get the head to um, match the right size of the body. So I always kind of start off the, with the head first, get my basic proportions, and at least I know what I'm looking at. And then mentally, I'm doing head measurements all the way down for the rest of the drawing. Um, this is just me. Uh, this may not be the right way to do this. But this is how I've taught myself how to do it. So at this point, I know, look, see what I did? I just did the spine. So I have the outside of the trunk. I know that there's a spine back in here somewhere in 3D space. 
And I know that from the uh, Abla Ongara, or whatever that's called right there, that Dracula admires so much, I know that there's mid-chest, rib cage uh, point right there. Uh, if they're gonna crack your ribs open, they start right here and start cutting up that way. <coughs> Excuse me. And then belly button, and so I know I'm working my way down the trunk with these measuring points that I know in my head, and then down to the bottom of the torso. And then I know that there is a measurement from like torso to kneecap joint. That's not a technical term, kneecap joint. And then this weird little leg part here that has um, thick bone on the outside and a little bone on the inside. And then foot. And then the same thing over here. And because you're looking in 3D space, you have to force yourself to say, okay, the kneecap is not down here because that would not be uh, in three-dimensional deal. It's back here. Three D space, three D space. So basically, I've just made the most crudest drawing I can, but at least it's kind of laid out in. Um, this looks like it's going to be a tennis serve. Okay, I'll talk this through in a second. Okay, this is either tennis or Caesar. I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, okay, so basic human being. Uh, this uh, elbow joint, how come I, how did I know that? Because the elbow joint is right here at the mid waist part and it flows all the way. No matter where it goes, it's going to do that. Now these shoulders are linked so that right now they're like this. But if they come forward, up, down, like this, it swings this around, you know. If the hips are here, the shoulders are here, you know, they kind of pull each other and they can go a little bit opposite like that. And then the spine is just hinging them. So picture, you know, two things on the end and the spine connecting them in the middle. And these two are, will always have to stay in relation, and these two will always have to stay in relation. You can twist it to a, to a large degree, uh, but those two go together. And these two points here are the main deal. And then you have your midpoint in the body, you know, which is somewhere around where your belly button is. Um, so that's what I'm looking for in the torso. Uh, and that's if the torso is straight. If the torso wants to bend over, um, you can do that, or it can bend backwards, you can do that, um, and you just have to know, okay, belly button, belly button, top, shoulders, point, and then the bottom of the torso. And you're just kind of bending it whichever way you want, like a beanie baby, I mean, you could, but there is a limit to what the spine can do. Um, and if you break the limit, then you break that person's back and you're responsible for that. Try to live with that. Okay, and then the um, forearm and the uh, upper arm match. Um, there's a ulna bone, a guiding bone on the wrist here that will be turning uh, and limiting the turn of this forearm, that guy. And I always look for it because it's a great way to hinge off the rest of the hand. And where it is, you know, what happens to it depends on how this arm is turning. So it's a great little point to, it's right here on this drawing. And then fingers. The easiest way to draw that at first is just do the mitten hand. Uh, don't worry about the individual fingers. You can do a mitten hand and get your uh, hand the right size Get the fingers in the right place, like that. Um, you could do, if you're looking at it head on, something like that. You have curvy hands. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so start with the mitten hand just to get your hand in the right place, and then you add in your fingers to make it work. Um, the measurement's going up here. Same thing over here. And uh, wherever you turn that hand is where that little uh, bump is going to be on that wrist. So... See, now at least I know where that hand goes, and it'll be easier to put in your fingers. I know that there's a rib cage here, and the rib cage is basically like this, like a, like body armor, which is exactly what it is. And then you've got your spine here, and then you've got um, the entire little assembly down here that's holding things together. In here is very uh, fragile stuff. So you try to protect it with muscles. And then one major bone there, one major bone there, a very complicated kneecap, and then this stuff down here. Okay, so that's what I'm looking at underneath the skin when I get in here. Um, when I get into the skull, we talked about the skull a couple times already. Um, what you do on top of the skull uh, can be such a wide variety of human faces. Um, if you want, we can do a, another more in-depth skull thing later. Okay, that's what I look at when I'm just sketching something out. That's kind of, I don't do this when I draw, but I think this when I draw. I think about, you know, if I need to get these arms to move in a different place, I'm thinking about, okay, well, how does that bone move? Where does that bone go? And if I want this hand to be, where is it, like, let's draw the 3D box. Here's something I've never seen anybody do. If this was an action figure and you put it in its its packaging box, it would look like that. And so when you're drawing, you're thinking about the, oh, here. When you're drawing, you're thinking about um, 3D space around this body and where it twists and turn. Um, the reason I'm pointing this out is because this will help you keep, make sure that if one shoulder is closer to the viewer than the other shoulder, that can become tricky for an artist. Like, how do I make sure that this looks like it's uh, closer to me and that's further away? If you're thinking in 3D space all along, you will, you will know to put that shoulder um, blade alignment like that. Well, shoulder blades are back here, but the collarbone alignment like that. Um, so I think that, you know, thinking in 3D really helps a person a lot. I've noticed that sculptors are really good at drawing. If a sculptor did this, they would be thinking in terms of body weights. You know, there would be a lot of mass in here. And this would be in the darkness like that. You know, because they see light and shadow, right? So, um, you can tell that from here I could just erase my rough lines and then draw a regular figure um, that would, you know, have, now if I go in and put skin on top of this, I can draw those, the pretty arms, the pretty waist, the, the muscular legs, the nice curve on the calves and all that. Then I, I, now I have something to put them on and they will look like they're in proportion. So I think what maybe what I'll do is um, I'll do that now, but I'll do it in time lapse so that it, you don't have to watch me do this for 20 minutes. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna go to time lapse. Okay, so that's it for today.
Terry got his um, drawing lesson in, and we'll refine that so that you guys get the information that you're looking for from him. So if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and um, email me at mail at abstractstudiocomics.com, and we'll try to address them. Okay. So you guys have a great week. Go Texans, and oh, sh**. <laughs>